Good morning. I don't know if it's still morning yet. Are we in the afternoon? Uh, good, uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, I want to start off by commending you on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, I want to congratulate you for your foresight in increasing funding to smoking cessation programs. Um, I have a program in Staten Island called Tobacco Against Tobacco that I partner with the Richmond County Medical <laughs> Society and the American Cancer Society. And uh, smoking rates in Staten Island are the highest in the state. When we look at when a child begins to start smoking, if they do, it's about 14 and a half nationwide. In Staten Island, that number is at 10 years old. So we thank you um, for having the foresight to know that to increase that will save the state in, in the long run. So thank you for that. Um, <coughs> in regards to early intervention rates and reimbursements, as a father of small uh, children, four small children, two of which are 15 months old, and my wife and I are very cognizant of the fact of their milestones. And we know that those milestones are very important and their pediatrician coaches us to make sure that those children are reaching those milestones and it's important, the flow of life, to get them. Because if they're not getting those milestones, then, then there's, there's, there's a problem with that. A uh, concern that, that I have in these cuts is, you know, sometimes when we have cuts across the board, sometimes we, to use a metaphor, sometimes we're better at cutting with a scalpel in some specific areas. Um, with that said, if you could just elaborate on how these cuts are going to affect. Um, are they more administrative or are they more at the therapeutic level? Because I'm hearing right now, um, you know, children, and infants and toddlers are gonna be going from maybe a few times a week to maybe once a month. And at that stage of life, one month is, is, is a very long time and I'm afraid that we may be, you know, pardon the pun, throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we skimp on this type of funding and it's gonna cost us in the long run as, as these children grow older. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, the early intervention program of New York State is among the best in the country. Uh, we're very proud of what we've been able to do for our most vulnerable children and we hope to maintain services as much as we can. New York State provides on average about 20 hours of service per month per child uh, enrolled, whereas the national average is six hours per month per child. So we, we are standard deviations beyond the rest of the country. And in this difficult financial environment, we've had to make some very difficult choices. Um, cuts to the EI program, uh, certainly we're trying to minimize the cuts and we're trying to figure out ways to squeeze out all of those efficiencies where we're doing that everywhere else as well. Uh, along those lines, trying to uh, protect the direct care services aspects of it is, is important, but there will be some reduction of services. Thank you. Um, in, in regards to the state preferred drug list, um, I, I notice uh, eliminating prescriber uh, prevails. Um, my concern with that is that I know you need to contain costs with the state PDL, but at the end of the day, the doctor really needs autonomy and the doctor needs to dictate and the doctor knows his patients best not a bureaucrat, not someone in an insurance company. And I just want to know, uh, you know, the appeals process that you're going to set up. Is it going to be cumbersome to deter the doctor to even get involved because physicians are under a lot of pressure right now. Not only are they physicians, but they're small business owners who are under fire that have a lot to do um, in their office. And um, I'm just concerned that when we take that power away from the physician, um, you know, there could be some detrimental consequences. Understood. Um, I think that, you know, New York's unique in the sense of having this uh, physician prevails language. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that the implementation of it would be in an intelligent way. Um, you know, I think, though, that um, generally speaking, Medicaid programs um, actually uh, provide a, a wider array of coverage than virtually any commercial or even Medicare Part D coverage. Um, we do not have a, what's called a closed formulary, meaning that um, we do not uh, specifically completely exclude uh, medications. Rather, uh, we do have prior authorization requirements with specific criteria. 
Um, I believe that if you, uh, and one of the things we're proposing to do is take a comprehensive relook um, at the drugs that are preferred on, on the state's preferred drug list uh, in concert with clinicians to see um, uh, where we are, is whether or not the coverage levels are appropriate or not. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think that if we uh, implement the elimination of the uh, physician prevails, it actually will strengthen the state's hand uh, significantly when it comes to negotiating with manufacturers. The, basically the way we do that is we um, uh, use our preferred drug list and the list of drugs that are preferred versus not preferred to negotiate supplemental rebates. Uh, and what the concern is is that without physician prevails, uh, with physician, physician prevails, uh, that weakens or perceives to weaken um, our, um, our PA criteria and therefore manufacturers are less willing to give us the drug. That said, um, the physician prevails is rarely ever used. Um, so we don't think that the, the current system is that much of an impediment uh, and therefore it's not as necessary of a roadblock uh, as has been in the case in the past. So um, you know, our hope is that uh, the mix of reforms uh, in the area of pharmacy uh, will uh, maintain access but at the same time still lower cost for taxpayers. Thank you. Um, to be a little bit more parochial, uh, in Richmond County, we only have two hospitals, Staten Island University Hospital and Rumsey, Richmond University Medical Center. Uh, we unfortunately have no HHC. We have no public hospital at all on Staten Island. And Staten Island, those two hospitals have to bear the brunt of all the indigent care um, in, in the region on, on Staten Island. Um, with that said, I thank you and, and the prior ad administration for the uh, heel grants. They made a major difference in saving Richmond University Medical Center, and they work. Richmond University Medical Center, which was once in the red, is, is, is now you know, in the black, and it's thanks to that heel grant. Um, with that said, I know there are some looming federal deadlines that monies that have already been allocated have to be spent by a certain time. And I know uh, Richmond University Medical Center uh, was awarded a certain amount of money, and they're concerned that they may not be able to beat the clock and spend that money in the time. And I'm just wondering, um, is there any provisions to be more flexible with these HEAL grants? Because um, I know that there were some capital projects that they could spend this money on now, but their hands may be tied with the HEAL grant that, that they can. Is yeah. there any flexibility? Uh, we're working uh, very closely uh, to get all the approvals and, and necessary waivers and look forward to working with you on this specific issue. Thank you. And, and just briefly, in closing, um, I look forward to really hearing uh, more from you on medical malpractice. Um, that is also something near and dear to my heart. Physicians are leaving this state by the droves, especially our OBGYNs, and it's really important that we get serious, and I look forward to hopefully seeing that this is a priority, a high priority of the department, and I thank you for your testimony today. Thank you.